As I mentioned earlier, the Archangel Chamuel, the Archia Charity, serve on the third ray. This is God's love, his creativity and beauty. And the color of the ray ranges from pink to rose to ruby. Their work corresponds with your heart chakra, which is also a rose and pink. It has 12 petals. Anahata chakra is the Hindu name for it. The day you feel love the most is Monday. And somehow Monday is also a day that can get easily disorganized and kind of make you not feel you're starting your week until Tuesday. And the reason that is, is that love, divine love, is the most opposed force on the entire planet. The fallen angels are determined to take from us divine love that we can express to one another, to all whom we meet. And so we have to be strong in our conviction to affirm love on that day and not let anything take from us the love of God. They work through the third band of the causal body and their retreat, which is in the heaven world, on a level of the heaven world, is over St. Louis, Missouri. Retreats in the earth were established long, long ago, before we reckon history or almost time. These retreats are centered at various places all over the earth. There are retreats of archangels and Elohim and ascended masters. There are universities of the spirit. There are cities of light, golden age cities of light, where we have passed wonderful experiences at the conclusion of one life and before we have entered the next life. So these retreats are where we go in what is called the etheric octave between embodiments so that we can prepare for the next. The word Chamuel, which is spelled C-H-A-M-U-E-L, means he who sees God. And when we have love in our hearts, we do see God. Druid mythology names the angel Camiel as the god of war. Some traditions say Archangel Chamuel was the angel who wrestled with Jacob and the angel who strengthened Jesus during his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Archangel Chamuel in charity delivered God's judgment on the Tower of Babel, causing the confounding of tongues. I have seen this in the Akashic records. All that transpires on earth is recorded in a dimension known as Akasha. Akasha is primary substance or etheric energy. It can absorb and record all the oppressions of life. It is truly awesome to behold the record of this mighty archangel standing over the Tower of Babel built by Nimrod to the glory of Nimrod. The ruby ray of the Lord's judgment came down through Chamuel in an instant. The people were speaking in different tongues. All was in chaos. Fright turned to anger, anger against the Lord and his angel. God, acting through his mighty archangel of the third ray, had confounded their speech. Because they could no longer communicate with each other, they could no longer conspire to do evil against God and his people. Nimrod was a rebel angel whose ambition it was to control the world. Rebels in high places are a fact of life on planet Earth. They have been here for thousands of years, ever since they lost the war in heaven to Archangel Michael and his legions, who banished them to the earth. Their ambitions have not changed. And yes, they move among us, wearing the same kind of bodies that we wear. Do the archangels and their hosts still wage war with fallen angels on behalf of the children of light? To answer the question, let's go back to Jewish mysticism and the system of the Kabbalah. In one system of the Kabbalah, Chamuel embodies the fifth sphera, Gevura. The spherot are extensions of the unmanifest God in the manifest world. The ten spherot make up the tree of life. Each one embodies a quality of God, and together they display the degrees of the divine manifestation. According to the Kabbalah, Gevura is divine justice. Thus, Chamuel is perceived as meeting out the severity of the judgments of God. But we must remember the comforting scripture. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. 
When in divine love the Lord meets out his chastenings, we know that Chamuel is bringing us back to reality, to our real self, stripped of all of our sense of human injustice. The fallen angel who is the imposter of Chamuel is Galeb. The archdevil opposing Chamuel is Asmodeus. So you see in the hierarchy of the fallen angels, they have attempted to create a false hierarchy that opposes each and every angel and archangel who are the servants of the light. And so the war does continue. Galeb is known as the depriver of manhood. This means that he strips the soul of her native endowment of God's light. Asmodeus works with him as the destroyer or exterminator, the perversion of, Gevu of Gevura, divine justice. But these imposters of the third ray of divine love are no match for the powerful and imposing forces of Chamuel and Charity and the covering cherubim. One glimpse of these fiery pink rose and ruby colored legions as they step out of the sun and into the lower kingdom where the warfare of light and darkness is not yet done with and you know you are in capable hands. Yes, the archangels and their hosts are still waging war against the rebel angels in the earth and on the lower astral planes and they are winning. You can join the legions of light as you champion the cause of children, the poor and homeless, and all who suffer under the yoke of personal and planetary karma. I remember how I once witnessed this protection of a divine angel and this opposition of a very dark angel. I had made a trip out to Cape Cod when I was studying in Boston. And I was in a situation where I felt the angel of the Lord protecting me, and I at the same time felt the force of a fallen angel attempting to wrest me from my allegiance to the good angel who stood by. And I awed in the presence of the power of this good angel, and also I observed the determination of the dark angel to tear me from what was the right and true and correct path. When you feel that power and presence of an angel defending you and you feel the adversary tempting you away from the good angel, then you will understand that the reason we do get into trouble is that we go the way of the bad angel, the rebel angel. We make a conscious decision to reject the protection of the angel of light and therefore the angel of light withdraws and leaves us to make our karma as we will. So this is why we do not all escape from the calamities of life or the wrong turns in the road. It is because ultimately the angels respect our free will. And so before you make a decision to go to the right or the left or to make major consequences, major turns in your life, it is very important to commune with God to listen to the inner voice and to have such a close presence at the altar of God that you can have the gift of the discernment of spirits that comes from the Holy Spirit and with that discernment truly know right from wrong. I was talking to someone that I hadn't talked to since high school and what he said to me, we're all being tested, aren't we? And I said, we surely are all being tested. And as the tests advance in this schoolroom of life, sometimes we think it is impossible to know right from wrong, because wrong seems right and right seems wrong in the moment, in the crucible, when all we have to go by is our relative vision to prepare for those tests and those initiations, which are always the testings of divine love. We need to prepare through daily prayer, a habitual going to the heart of God and communing, keeping in touch with God, keeping in touch with your guardian angel, feeling free to talk with the archangels because you know that each week and in each month, if you have strayed from what you think is the best and right way and right conduct. 
You have confessed this in your heart to God. You have given prayers, assigned yourself a penance, and told God and your guardian angel, I really want to make this thing right. Let me perform a service or give special prayers or go out and help people in my community because I don't want this to be a blot on my record. If you keep yourself striving to do the best you know how to do, you'll make some mistakes, but you'll learn from them. And if you're really determined to get where you're going, you will not repeat them. You can say, OK, I fell in that mud hole, but I'm not going to fall in it again. I see that trap, and I'm not going to fall for it another time. And so life is a schoolroom. God expects you to make mistakes, but he expects you not to make them too many times, to get out of the rut and move on and exercise that inner willpower. And more than that, prayer to God to strengthen you in the moment when you could again fall into that rut. So be mindful of your words and actions and even your feelings toward others. When the angels see that you are self-correcting and trying to do the best you can possibly do by everyone, they will give you such support and help. And what could be pain and sorrow is a joyous, challenging day by day of anything that might assail your path. How do Chamuel's legions appear to us? Depending on their assignment, the legions of divine love, who lovingly administer God's justice, may appear in full battle regalia or in ceremonial dress. They may come in the softness of the mother to comfort life, robed in layers of chiffon, as it were, actually layers of gossamer light, as they caress souls who are weary in their fight for freedom. All the archangels are healers. They come as master surgeon to repair bodies and mend the rents in the garments of the soul. There is no field of learning in which they do not excel. With Elohim, who are the co-creators of life and form, they also have power to create and uncreate life. In sum, archangels are extraordinary beings, nothing less than the extensions of God himself, personified in form as God's grace and majesty and power incarnate. Archangel Chamuel and Charity welcome us to study in their retreat in the heaven world over St. Louis. Our souls can travel there during sleep. Just before you retire at night, call to Archangel Michael and his legions of angels to escort you to the realms of light to attend classes in the universities of the spirit. The retreats of the archangels are now open to souls of merit. They have not been open for centuries. These retreats are well above the pollutions of earth on a level of the heaven world called the etheric plane. Although you may not remember what you have studied in one of the archangels' retreats, your soul knows, and little by little, the information trickles down to your mental awareness. In their retreat, Archangel Chamuel and Charity teach you to develop the qualities of mercy and compassion, loving care and concern for others. They teach you to replace all sense of injustice in relationships with supreme trust that there is in reality no injustice anywhere in the universe and the trust in the ultimate resolution of divine love. This will and can happen only if you in childlike faith will let go and let God and his emissaries meet out divine justice. Archangel Chamuel and Charity teach you how to intensify the flame of love in your heart and to prepare for the descent of the Holy Spirit into your temple. They promise to heal the many layers of the human aura of anyone who offers devotion and service to them. They say, each time you offer to God decrees to the violet flame and songs of praise and prayers of heartfelt sincerity, the angels may in turn take from your aura and your body some of the burdens that you carry. If you invite us, we will come home with you. We will help you with difficult situations you may be dealing with among the members of your family. We will help you in problem situations with your neighbors, your relatives, and in the workplace. We will address whatever is most burdensome to your heart. 
We will even help you to find a job or a parking place. We will do anything you ask as long as it is lawful for us to do in the sight of God. Notice that Chamuel and Charity prefaced their promise with a condition, if you invite us. They said, if you invite us, we will come home with you. Archangel Chamuel teaches that the angels are polite and reverent. He says, we respect God's laws of freedom that guarantees you free will in all matters. Thus, when you call not, when you invoke not, the angels enter not, even in time of calamity or cataclysm or personal crisis. God has set his law in motion, and you who abide in this which has been called the footstool kingdom must understand that earth is the footstool of God and of heaven. On earth, you are in control. But if you will it so, if you are willing to set your human will aside, then God in you can be in control. God in you can be in control. But then you must pray as the Savior did in purest love. Not my will, but thine be done. And when you do, beloved, the will of God takes command of your life. And angels unseen implement that will step by step as you cooperate with it day by day. This statement notwithstanding, many of you here have, in, have experienced the intercession of angels in your life. This has come to you because, A, you have had an ongoing relationship with God and his angels in this and past lives, even though outwardly you may not be aware of it. There's more to you than just your outer mind. Or B, from the level of the subconscious mind, your very soul is crying out to God, imploring his assistance. Moreover, the prayer of the heart that may not even be articulated in words or consciously formulated reaches the throne of grace and receives an immediate response directly from the heart of God. Even the prayer of desire, the all-consuming desire to liberate loved ones from the bondage of pain and suffering is answered by God's angelic ministrants. In other words, they will answer from every level of your being whatever that level is, conscious or unconscious, where you are reaching out to God for help. You may not be conscious that your soul is and has been for a long time engaged in interior prayer. Rest assured that God always answers the prayer of the heart. In addition, he answers by way of sending his ministering angels to be your guides, guardians, and friends. Because he knows you need this very personal support to get through life, God created angels to be extensions of himself in this imperfect world we live in. A very sure way to meet your guardian angel is to call to God to send his violet flame. When your aura is filled with violet light, not one but many guardian angels will come to you. I would like to show you how to call forth the violet flame and keep your aura as it looks in the lower figure in the chart. This decree is called, I am the violet flame. And when you use the name of God, I am, you're saying, God in me is the violet flame. You're using the name of God, which God gave to Moses for us. So when you say, I am the violet flame in action in me now, and so forth, you are affirming, where I am, there God is. I visualize his violet flame around me now. I see the purity of my chakras. I see that crystal core descending from my Christ self and I am presence. I am accepting that my I am presence is releasing the violet flame in answer to my call. And this violet flame is specifically used for purification. The violet ray is a ray of purification and it purifies your aura when you're among a lot of people downtown and shopping, in throngs of people anywhere, you take on in your aura a lot of substance from other people, good and bad. And so sometimes when you get home, you feel drained or tired. You call for the violet flame to transmute and restore your aura. The violet flame can erase records of karma, of past lives. It is the great gift to us of Saint Germain. Together, I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame 
To light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing every one. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing every one. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing every one. Archangel Chamuel in charity invite you to pray to them daily to protect your physical heart, your heart chakra, and your threefold flame. They say that the heart's sensitivity to good and bad vibrations is very great. The heart registers both thought and feeling waves. They remind us to be wary of evil spirits who would snuff out the flame of God that burns on the altar of the heart. These spirits work directly against the heart, making it vulnerable to heart disease, heart ailments, and heart attacks. Chamuel teaches that your devotion to your Father, Mother, God guarantees you the protection of the heart and the heart chakra. But he also gives some practical advice on how you can have a healthier heart. He advises you to nourish your heart with natural, organically grown foods, especially grains, to cut out dairy products, margarine, and to refrain from eating red meat as much as possible, if not altogether. I would like to offer with you the heart meditation on page 5, number 16. It has just the four lines. As a rose unfolding fair wafts her fragrance on the air, I pour forth to God devotion, one now with the cosmic ocean. I'd like to invite you to place your hands over your heart, if you can do that, and also say the mantra or read it. And visualize your 12-petaled heart chakra unfolding just like a rose. The fragrance of your heart is your devotion to God and your love for all people. You pour forth your devotion to God, and then you visualize yourself one with the whole cosmic ocean of God's consciousness. Now, in these four lines, you have the metaphor and the deep understanding of your soul that your heart is a rose that is unfolding. And the fragrance of that heart simply goes out to God as devotion. So we pour forth to God devotion, and as we pour it forth, because this devotion is ours and we are giving it to God, we can move with that devotion because we are a part of it. So our own devotion and ourselves one with that devotion now allows us to be one with the cosmic ocean of God's consciousness. This is a very profound little mantra. If it has meaning for you, take it up each day. It is one of those mantras of divine love that guards us against the sharp word, something unkind, something thoughtless, something that hurts someone. When we have a momentum of the mantras of love in our heart, then we are in control and we do not let out these things that cause burdens to people. So the love mantras are very important. Let us give this together. As a rose unfolding fair wafts her fragrance on the air, I pour forth to God devotion, one now with the cosmic ocean. As a rose unfolding fair wafts her fragrance on the air, I pour forth to God devotion, one now with the cosmic ocean. As a rose unfolding fair wafts her fragrance on the air, 
I pour forth to God devotion, one now with the cosmic ocean. You will find in our angel booklets and in our other published tapes of mantras and decrees and songs that some of them you like better than others, some of them you like to give more often. There's a mantra for everyone and any number of mantras for all of us. Pick your mantra and let it be something profoundly meaningful to you that each time you say the words, you can feel the words happening and more than the words because somewhere inside of you there is a resonance with that particular mantra or decree. And so through it, it's like a grid of energy. Through it, your heart's devotion is magnified. God magnifies it again and sends it back to you. So devotion, in whatever way, is your way, is the way that we keep angels with us. Because devotion opens the channels. Our devotion goes to God and the angels. And therefore, we've opened a highway to our God. And the angels travel down that highway back to our hearts. You can give this prayer as a mantra many times a day, as a means of sustaining your tie to God. As you meditate on the God of love, pronouncing these four lines, you can actually go into a spiritual ecstasy that comes from the releasing of the love in your heart. And it increases and increases. I would like to recommend this book to you that is called Heart. It was written down 1932 by Helena Rorick. It is the teaching of the Ascended Masters. It is all about the preciousness of your heart, the guarding of your heart, the stilling of the heart, and your heart as a center and an, as an opening to God. Very important as you advance on the path and you become sensitive to the jagged vibrations of the world, energies of war and anger and so forth, as these reverberate on your body, your soul, your chakras, and your heart, you come to the realization that it is necessary to under, understand the path of the heart, even as Jesus reveals to us his sacred heart and Mary, his mother, reveals to us her immaculate heart. The guarding of the heart is the key to the attainment of higher levels of initiation. Archangel Chamuel and Charity are the facilitators of this veritable rapprochement of your soul with God through the medium of divine love. They teach you the path of wholeness because only through the restoration of wholeness can you come to grips with your psychology. The soul is the part of you that went out from the presence of God through the exercise of free will. The term inner child that many of you have heard is another name for the soul. Your inner child needs to become one with an inner loving adult. And before that can happen, your inner adult must become loving. That's because your inner adult is formed and patterned after the model of your parents. If you had perfect parents, your inner adult would be perfect like them. But if you didn't, you will have to work at remolding your inner adult as well as your inner child according to the pattern of your higher self, your holy Christ self, and your guardian angel. When your inner adult is made whole by your loving of your inner child and all whom you meet, then you merge with your holy Christ self and your guardian angel. You are the only one who can save your soul or your inner child. How do you do it? You do it through the sacred heart of Jesus and the sacred heart of your own holy Christ self. You do it by loving that soul, that inner child, and delivering that child of the painful memories that have marred the soul from conception. I recommend these books for this important step in your soul growth. This is Your Inner Child of the Past by Hugh Misseldine. Healing Your Aloneness by Erica Chopich and Margaret Paul. And then the latest book by Margaret Paul, which just came out, 
is inner bonding. It's written for those who have read Healing Your Aloneness and would like a step-by-step -step program of how to go through the process of inner bonding. Then there is the Inner Child Workbook by Catherine Taylor and Healing the Child Within by Charles Whitfield. The process of resolution can never be complete unless you are willing to balance the negative karma you have with those who are closest to you. This means you need to forgive and forget, to pray for others, to quell impatience. It is well to remember that ultimately there is no injustice anywhere in the universe. You need to quell your insensitivity to others' needs and your sense of injustice. We need to face the fact that we have all made mistakes in the past that require us to serve to set life free. And that means anyone who may come into your life. Admitting your responsibility to right all past wrongs is the first step toward wholeness on the path of divine love. You need to get into the mode of helping others, of going the extra mile, and forgiving 70 times 7. Archangel Chamuel and Charity are pledged to reunite you with your twin flame if you obey the law of divine love and you are willing to balance your karma, even through great sacrifice and hard work. Twin flames are divine complements. God created you with another half. There was a white fire body of light, a sphere of wholeness. God took this sphere and out of it created two of you, twins, identical twins, two halves of the divine whole. While you lived in the levels of perfection, you were always one. When you left the presence of God, sometimes somewhere along the way, you started making karma with other people started getting into other relationships, started quarreling with your twin flame, and became separated for long centuries. You grew farther and farther apart. Sometimes now you don't encounter your twin flame for many lifetimes. You feel alone without your other half, and the sense of aloneness can be all-consuming. The book Healing Your Aloneness teaches you how to go about restoring your inner wholeness through communication with your inner child and inner adult. Wholeness is a state of being one with God and in harmony with the various compartments of your own self. By engaging in the process of working on yourself daily, you free up your creative energies so that you can attract your twin flame. Unless you establish a direction of wholeness in your life and make inner and outer wholeness a daily priority, you run the risk of your twin flame not recognizing you or you not recognizing your twin flame. Wholeness means striving to be who you were in the beginning with your twin flame so you can be together in the reality, not the illusion, of your true self today. Chamula and Charity teach us the way to unite with our twin flame. It's first to unite with your own God presence. In that pole star of being, they say, in that magnet of sacred fire, you shall become a blazing sun to draw unto yourself your twin flame. They say that the way to union with your twin flame is to get busy and do the job that you know very well God has assigned you to do, even if you don't want to. Just do it with a joyous heart, because it happens to be your karma. Be joyous that you have the opportunity to balance karma every day. Chamuel and Charity teach that ye love one another as I have loved you is the word of your Holy Christ Self spoken to you and to your twin flame. For painful as it might be, you are separated from your twin flame for only one reason. You have not loved one another as Christ has loved you individually and therefore the karma of non-loving has produced the separation. Think about that. Let perfect love cast out your fear of being alone, separated from God and your twin flame. Invoke the violet flame with the promise, O oh God, never again may I injure my twin flame or any part of life. If you love one another as Christ has loved you forever, 
so it will be counted unto you as the expression of love for your twin flame. In other words, whoever you are with, in whatever relationship, family, friends, relatives, neighbors, whoever you meet in the workplace, when you give to everyone the love that you would give to your twin flame, that love does go to your twin flame and is counted toward the restoration. So when you see people, remember, Christ dwells in them, they have a guardian angel. Give all the abundance of love of your heart and know that that love is never lost, never wasted, no matter what the reaction, because pure divine love returns to the heart of God always after you have sent it through whoever you are loving. Chamuel and Charity tell us, love all life free and you see, you will balance every injustice that has separated you from the beloved of your heart. Whatever you do at work or play, don't quit because somebody looks at you wrong or speaks to you wrong. Don't quit until you have sought understanding, peace, and at least mutual respect where a disagreement has come between yourself and another. When all that can be said has been said, move on. You can't make people like you, but you can always be kind. Americans at their worst are self-indulgent. They don't see why they should have to balance their karma because Jesus already paid the price for their sins, or so they've been told. So they walk away from responsibility because it's hard, it's painful, it's unpleasant to be tied to somebody or some situation they just don't feel like being tied to. It's dirty work, and Americans like clean work. Stick with it and balance your karma by serving to set life free, most importantly those nearest to you. Give your decrees to the violet flame with all due diligence and dedication, and by and by you will balance that karma, and you will never have to deal with that situation or that person again. That is, unless you make more negative karma with that person, or unless things have so improved because you have balanced the karma involved and worked on your psychology that you can now see the worth of the relationship. Yes, it's important that you accept your assignments from God to balance your karma. It's also important that you don't develop a false sense of responsibility and stay too long in a situation when you have A, balanced your karma, and B, transcended the association. So these are some tips on how you can balance the karma that separates you from your twin flame. Let's say you're sitting next to your twin flame right now. This happened in a conference once. Two people who'd never met each other sat down in the, cent in the front row and they happened to be twin flames. And I was watching in the whole conference to see when they were gonna figure this out. <laughs> well, they did figure it out. And they got married and lived happily ever after. <laughs> so your karma, whether it's with your twin flame or anybody else, may very well snatch from you the relationship you've been waiting for all of your life and perhaps for lifetimes. Your karma may also deprive you of a greater intimacy with your chief guardian angel. Yes, karma can rob you of deep and satisfying relationships at all levels. And so until you have balanced 100% of your karma, any karma you have left is a possible point of separation and division between you and your God and you and your twin flame. Although many twin flames are separated in physical dimensions, their souls work together in the heaven world, in the retreats of the archangels and the universities of the spirit. The Archia Charity is the twin flame of Archangel Chamuel. She has worked for centuries to help Earth's children balance their karma through service to life. She tutored the ascended Lady Master Nada, a very great spiritual being, in her final embodiment on Earth. Nada was the youngest child in a large, exceptionally gifted family. The Archia Charity appeared to her at a young age and taught her how to draw God's love from her heart and radiate it into the nature kingdom for the blessing of life. Charity taught Nada to expand her threefold flame so that she might be instrumental in the quickening of her brothers' and sisters' chakras. 
Nada supported her siblings while they achieved standing in their respective professions. Her inner spiritual work was to tend the flame on the altar of their hearts while they used their energies and talents to make major contributions to their culture. Nada explains that to all appearances she had not accomplished much in a worldly sense. Yet her joy and eternal reward came in nourishing the hearts of her family that they might succeed and in knowing that her service had been essential to their victory. Indeed, Nada made her ascension at the conclusion of that lifetime of surrender to love and selflessness in service as she sacrificed what might have been a brilliant career of her own. This is an artist's conception of Nada as an ascended lady master. It captures the fire of her aura and presence. You can use it to meditate on her great mastery of the living flame of love. Nada serves on the karmic board of seven ascended or cosmic beings who adjudicate the karma of Earth and her evolutions. Some of you have read books about people who were regressed and remember experiences they had before they were born. They remember being counseled by a group of spiritual advisors regarding what they would have to deal with in their next life. What they are remembering is their interaction with the Lords of Karma, who make up the seven-member karmic board. When you are born, you come with a package of your good karma and a package of your not-so-good karma. The first karma you meet in life is your parents. And usually your heaviest karma is with your parents. Or it may be with your brothers and sisters, extended relations, your marriage partners or partner, your children, your employers or employees, or all of the above. If you can understand this and you really desire to be free, you can do a lot of resolving, a lot of forgiving and a lot of loving. A good book that records people's experiences with spiritual counselors between our lives on earth is Life Between Life by Fisher and Witten. This is a very remarkable book. The case studies are factual, and I find that when I'm talking to someone who doesn't understand karma or death and experiences an unforeseen sudden death of a loved one, that if they are able to read this book, they can find some logic to human existence and understand why sometimes people are taken so suddenly from life. So if you read this and have a copy of it and several copies, you have it there. And you can send more than a card of condolences. You can send something that people can lock into that will give them hope and vision and comfort. Archangel Chamuel teaches us how to challenge the forces of anti-love. He has given us a mantra that will definitely do the trick. The force of anti-love is anything that opposes the manifestation of God and God's love within you. It is any little irritation, any anger, any argument, any crosswords, any passivity that prevents you from getting a job done. It's every force that is anti the light within you. It's every force that violates the integrity, the honor, and the freedom your, of your soul. It is everything from mild dislike and criticism and condemnation to abject hatred. Samuel says these forces of anti-love are subtle and they are both within the subconscious of ourselves and they are in the world at large. They have inserted themselves into your psyche through authority figures, for example, who have engendered within you feelings of self-dislike, self-condemnation, and an absence of self-worth. All of those come under the heading of the forces of anti-love. Chamuel says, purging your house of the force of anti-love is a means of preparing your soul for wholeness and for empowerment by the archangels. The archangels cannot give you the power to achieve and accomplish in this world all the good causes that you would sponsor until you rid yourself of these forces of anti-love. Because when you still allow them to be part of your household or part of your own psyche, then you see at any random moment unexpectedly, you could unleash this force of anti-love and abuse the power that God could give you through the archangels. 
This is how all of humanity have lost the empowerment of God. This is why our lives have been shortened to three score and ten. They're being extended somewhat these days. But they say people used to live hundreds of years. Some people don't believe that Bible story, but I do. That's because people didn't misuse God's power. And so they had the power of God to extend their life to 110, 180, 200 years, and so on. So if you are seeking the power of God for a good cause to make something happen in your town, you need that power and energy. You need that abundance of supply. You have to tackle the forces that would divide you and therefore cause you to lose God's energy. God is very conservative with his energy. He places it as an investment in people who do not allow themselves to become discordant and angry or even mean toward anyone. So Chamuel says, be prepared to deal with the forces of anti-love. They will not leave you voluntarily. Know when they have their hooks into you. Therefore, you need to give with me the fiat, he says, that will banish them forever. And this is the fiat that Archangel Chamuel gave this past October in New York City when I was there and delivered the dictation. He says, each time you give this fiat, you must call to me to give it with you. And this is what you say. In the name of God, I am that I am. In the name Archangel Chamuel, be gone, forces of anti-love. Here you are exercising your right to command the forces of darkness to leave you, to quit your household, to get out of your workplace, to get out of your life, and to get out of bothering your children, your neighborhood, your town. When you call and say God's name, in the name of the archangel who is sponsoring the action and give the fiat, then the archangels and their legions are empowered by you to go to work and solve the problem. All you have to do is say the first part once, in the name of God I am that I am, in the name Archangel Chamuel. The second part, be gone, forces of anti-love. You say it nine times to give it the momentum and authority of your entire being. Now, I would like you to think of a situation that you know about at home, in school, at work, in the politics of the city. Any situation you can think of right now that you know is a div divisive force that is con contributing to the breakdown rather than the coming together of people in community or family action. Does everybody have something in mind? Just, if you don't have anything in mind, think about child abuse. Isn't that a force of anti-love? Wouldn't you like to be at the side with Archangel Chamley right now of every child in this town that might be suffering from child abuse, from foster parents, from real parents, from who knows who? Wouldn't you like to be able to know that you did something for that child? Well, you can. Now, can you assemble everything you can think of right now of the trouble spots in the world? Where there is the force of anti-love. Remember, see it happening. It's very important when you give prayers together. In the name of God, I am that I am. In the name, Archangel Chamuel. Be gone, forces of anti-love. 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 Thank you. Please be seated. Archangel Chamuel is emphatic. He says the seven archangels and their hosts have the solutions to even the most serious problems of our cities and nation, such as organized crime, drugs, illiteracy, gangs, the national debt, and AIDS. They are on top of the elements of your psychology, and they can show you how to get on top of them yourself. He promises, Scout's honor, that if you keep the vigil with the archangels, the solutions to all your problems will be found. Chamuel says, 
Why not commit a minimum of 15 minutes a day without fail to giving one or more of your favorite prayers from the angel booklet just to maintain your ties to us so that waking or sleeping you will receive the light we pass through your chakras that brings resolution day by day. Archaea Charity promises that two angels of her bands will stand by you until the hour of your ascension as long as you walk the path of divine love. These angels are understudies of the cherubim. They will serve as guardians to protect you against malice, slander, and all misunderstandings directed against you. Their joy and their reason for being is to adore the threefold flame that burns in your heart. Charity says your devotion to these angels will increase the aura of pink light surrounding your heart chakra. I would like to now acquaint you with the holy office of the covering cherubim. Cherubim is the Hebrew plural of cherub. The word cherubim comes from the Akkadian word meaning one who prays or one who intercedes or from the Assyrian word which means to be near. Thus cherub means near ones, personal servants, bodyguards or courtiers. In rabbinic and occult lore, cherubim are the throne bearers and charioteers of God as they personify the winds. Their role is to guard the holiness of God. Kabbalists associated the cherubim with Yesod, the ninth sphera on the tree of life. According to the Kabbalah, Yesod is the foundation. It represents the procreative life force of the universe. In Christianity, the cherubim are among the highest orders of angels. The cherubim are the first angels to be mentioned in the Old Testament. Genesis says that after the Lord God expelled Adam and Eve from paradise, he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In the Old Testament, the cherubim bear God's throne in the Holy of Holies, which is the innermost sanctuary of the temple. The Bible describes the Lord as dwelling between the cherubim. The Lord instructed Moses that in building the tabernacle, he should place a gold cherub on each side of the mercy seat, which is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. The Lord said to Moses, the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony. I will speak with thee of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. One commentator writes, According to the old rabbis, the name of the one cherub on the mercy seat was righteousness and the name of the other was mercy. But some ancient interpreters have said that while usually their faces were half turned away from each other, yet when peace and righteousness ruled among the people, they turned toward each other and bending forward, kissed each other. In Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, the walls were covered with carvings of cherubim. The book of Ezekiel records Ezekiel's vision of four cherubim. He writes, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. Ezekiel described each cherub as having four faces, four wings, and hooves like those of a calf. He said, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. In Islam, the cherubim continually praise God by chanting, Glory to Allah. They are said to dwell in a place where the devil cannot attack them. Up until the 11th century, cherubim were depicted with mature faces framed by two to six large wings. This image was meant to convey the pure spirit, intelligence, and swiftness of the cherubim. In later religious art, the cherubim were standardly depicted with plump infant heads and curly hair, framed by a cluster of small wings. 
Thus was lost the original understanding of cherubim as the powerful fiery guardians of the covenants of God made with his people through Moses.